Welcome back to the Talking Rangers YouTube channel. We are back at last. QPR have given me absolutely no choice but to dust off the camera. We've had manager depart, manager inbound, and of course that wasn't enough. We've renamed the stadium, renamed the training ground, and then we've decided that that wasn't enough, so we thought we'd have a new chairman into that mix. Now, before we get into it and go through each one of those topics, thank you very much, Clive, for joining me. Clive, how are we? Um, very much interested to hear your thoughts on everything that has evolved. So I'm so tired, mate. Love for Words has been a full-time job this week. I, like, just, I can't wait to see what's coming tomorrow. It's like a Craig David song, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's get straight into it. Uh, we've got plenty to talk about. That's one thing for yeah, sure. So, thanks, okay, let's try and quickly like wrap up the Ainsworth before we just digressed into new manager situation. Um, 18.52 win, percent, win percentage for Ainsworth. Um, rather shambolic. Writing was on the wall. He was dealt an extremely tough pack of cards coming into the club at, at you know, a point when many QPR fans thought, was this the right time for him to come in and potentially ruin his legacy? He hasn't quite ruined his legacy, but he hasn't lived up to what we'd have hoped of, at least for the expectations that he set as a player. What was your kind of overarching summary and now almost that um, post feeling now that Ainsworth has, has departed the club? Pretty glad it's over. Um... I mean, I'll tell you what I think and then see, see, and we'll see what you think. But I, I'm pretty glad it's over because however well or badly we thought it was going to, it's gone way worse. Like, mm. I can't actually believe how how bad it, it and he was. Um, like, you saw the very least you expected was sort of the team to be motivated and be hard to play against and attack in wide areas and good from set pieces and quite physical and you know, organised defensively and like even the very basics of what you would hope a Gareth Ainsworth team would be able to do and look like we just were incapable. Um, he looked at, out of his depth to me, sadly, like because I loved him as a player. That Holloway team was what I grew up with. That was my happiest time at QPR. So I desperately wanted it to work, work for him. But just the two games against Blackburn and the two games against Coventry, if you end up, as soon as he ended up against someone like Yondal Thomason or Mark Robbins, who are, you know, they're decent managers, but they're not, it's not Pep, is it? But mm -hmm. as soon as you end, as soon as he ended up against a manager like that, he just looked completely out of thought and completely out of his depth. The point you make about the inheritance that he had is right. Like horrendous situation to walk into. Um, and then you've just got to ask yourself, well, could he be doing more with the limited thing that he's got? And you had to give him the sort of excuse that it was a poor team and all the shitness he walked into is is there. Could he be doing more? I think undoubtedly, like what we've been watching the last few months, undoubtedly he could and should have been doing better than that. Um, it's just been really bleak. The, like I said, the two biggest things for me were you couldn't even... tell. You couldn't even say that the basics of a Gareth Ainsworth team were being done. What you would, the absolute minimum you would hope from him wasn't being done. And the other thing, I think a team's got to have an identity about how it plays, whether it wants the ball or doesn't, whether it's an attacking team or a defensive team, whether it it wants possession or it doesn't want possession. And I think Gareth Ainsworth naturally as a manager, he wants his team to be the underdog. He doesn't want it to have the ball. He wants to shit house. He wants to waste time. But he kind of felt paranoid about doing that at QPR. And every time he tried to open up, he couldn't do it and the players couldn't do it. So the team had no real identity about whether it was going to be a QPR team or an Ainsworth team. And it ended up kind of being neither. Um, so, yeah, I, it was a bleak watch. But, I mean, how have you how have you found it? Like, I haven't seen you much, which probably has <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no. To be fair, I, <laughs> the only game, the first. Uh, to be fair, I don't like to admit this, but Saturday was the first game since I've ever had my season ticket. I actually chose not to go to QPR game. I'd had enough. The writing was on the wall. I thought we were going to get absolutely tonked, and I just lost any affiliation or any emotional, almost attachment to the team that's walk walking out on that pitch. And you kind of some of your summary there is very much similar to mine in terms of identity and the Ainsworth almost style. Now, 
Ainsworth isn't as we are fully aware and we signed up for. He is not a, he's not tactically prowess. He doesn't do things beautifully. He gets the basics right. And you, you'd have liked to have hoped that the teams you've seen in the past of Wickham, he's got players that are bought into him and are fighting for him on that pitch. When you have so many almost um, inadequacies in other areas and you don't do the things that or you, ain't, you aren't able to project onto the players the things that you have got to this stage or to this level for, and you haven't managed to bring that squad and ingrain some of just those key basic values that um, Ainsworth sides are supposed to have, then you're in a really, really big problem. And when there's not been any form of progression throughout the season, or like you talked about identity and what we're trying to do with the ball and he just didn't nail down any form of continuity that allowed any form of progression. Um, and you kind of look at it and you go, how were we when he first came in? So how are we are now? Once he's, he's brought in some more players that he wants in that transfer window. And all be, I understand all free transfers, et cetera, et cetera. But he had to do more. We, we have a better squad than at least three sides in this league. I do believe that. Um and when it just continues to show no signs of getting better and just got worse and worse and worse, sadly, um, taking it and keep your hat off, um, time is up, isn't it, really? So I don't, I don't think the players want to play like that. No. But I'm watching them at Leeds and West Brom, and there's just no, there's no plan there for how we're going to score a goal. It's just like, give the ball to them, sit deep here. Hopefully in the last 10 minutes, it'll either be nil-nil or we'll be one-nil down and then we might get a corner or something. Mm. I just think like even players, Steve Cook, Jack Colbert, they're not like brilliant players who've won World Cups and things, but they have won bits and pieces and they've played in the yeah. Premier League and they've had decent managers. They're at the end of their careers. I just, Ainsworth relies so much on that buy-in, like you say. I don't think players like that want to be standing at Leeds on a Tuesday, Tuesday Wednesday night in the cold and the wet and their only instruction when you've got the ball is knock it into the channel for Sinclair to run after. Yeah. And even if he, even if he does get there and he's onside, which he never is. Yeah, Christ, then, thing then, on then you know, there's then what yeah. then what do we do from there? There was no I can't believe the players actually want to play like that. And the amount of times just lately I've seen players like with the ball at their feet, gesturing like this with their arms out, like they don't know what to do with it. Nobody's showing for it. Even our goal at Huddersfield was actually off a move where three of them had been passing it between them and actually falling out with each other. Like, well, don't give it back to me. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. And we got a corner off that because that's how bad Huddersfield are. Yeah. So, yeah, I just like it's been way worse than even the most pessimistic of us could have thought it would. Surely we didn't think it would go as badly as it did. Mm. Okay. Uh, let's, let's try to move on from this. This dwell and let's enjoy almost this high, this little bit of optimism that we've got with this new manager appointment. Now, just before we come on to him, I'm going to talk a little bit about almost the recruitment process, the approach, the ballsiest situation, the the maddest thing. This club, I mean, just when you look at the decision making for these last twelve months, this was that moment for me where you just go, look, we're going nowhere, we're second bottom. We're six points away from safety this early on in the season. This is that moment where you pull that trigger and you go, let's just get us a man that knows how to get out of this position in this league. QPR had other ideas. I mean, some of the other names across the board, obviously I'm talking referring to Warnock there. Yeah, Gary Rowett, Nathan Jones, um, Lamucci. What were kind of your thought process, Clive, in terms of was Warnock the... How did you feel more not came about? What kind of direction were you expecting? Like, and then to where, to where we ended up. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you go from Gareth Ainsworth to Marty Sif Winters? I mean, I yeah. don't, you know, I don't want to be a smart ass, but I did in my 442 season preview, I did say that's exactly what they would do. And I I said it would be in October as well. So I squeezed in by two days. So I'm, I am pretty <laughs> smart about that. Um yeah, I mean, it's just mad, isn't it? This is it. Like I always sit on podcasts like this and say, you need to take the long term option. You need to like set the style of play. 
Um, if you change managers all the time and nothing improves, then the manager isn't your problem and whatever. So like Sif Wentz or Fifth Wentz, as he uh, has said on the official yeah, website. Yeah, is it like yeah. a like a he needs, he needs to abandon he needs to abandon that idea. They're not going to be doing that. <laughs> they're going to be singing about Paella and Estrella and all of that. They're getting they, they're not yeah. pronouncing your name with an F. You're going to have to get over that for a start. Um, so he's basically like the king loft for words appointment. That's exactly what I always say. That's the guy you need. And then just leave mm. him in charge. And he'll build this like McKenna or Ipswich and people like that. I think on this occasion, even I might have been able to get on board with a short term rescue like Warnock type. Um, so it, you're right. It does seem mad to do it now. I mean, the two things, a lot of the managers that get linked Rauer, Lamucci and Jones. And I think they spoke to four or five managers last week and maybe those guys were amongst it, maybe not. I think you people are really bad at separating out who QPR or who any club are actually after and who's just being punted around by journalists, mm. people trying to build clout on social media and agents trying to keep their clients in the news. Um because I think some of the names that got linked when just, you know, our former delightful manager, Mick Beale, for one, there's absolutely no way that that was ever going to happen, that it was ever on the cards at QPR. So that's been, that's been put around by him because he needs a job now. You know, he's linked with every job going, but he's doing that. Like, mm. we've got to get better, you know, particularly online. The online, I've got to get better at recognising, well, that's not a genuine link. That's an agent or a journalist doing a mate a favour. So I think it was a little bit of that. With Warnock, it was definitely a possibility, but he's coming at it from a, the club are going to have to get on top of this because if Sifuentes doesn't do well, then everybody's going to be like, it was a choice between him and Warnock. You've made this choice, you're idiots. You should have made a Warnock choice. They're going to get absolutely caned for it. Yeah, I'm not sure it was that much of a choice because like Warnock's just kept Huddersfield up. So his stock's quite high. He's 75 years old. He's basically retired. He can take whatever job he likes as they come up he'll get linked with every job that comes up in this division and he can dictate the terms so you know he's he's able to say to QPR well yeah I'll come but I want a big budget in January and we can't offer him that and I want a massive bonus if I do keep you up and we can't offer him that either so I'm not mm. convinced it was Warnock definitely wants it we can definitely afford him and he can definitely come Sifuentes definitely wants it we can definitely afford it and he can definitely come and it's a straight choice between I'm not sure They'll have spoken to Warnock. He'll have told them, this is what I want. We're not able to afford it. So it's not bit, It's not actually they've gone, he's our guy and Warnock isn't. It's just they couldn't really afford Warnock. Um, so Fuentes, they has been on the cards for a long time. Like They wanted him when Beal got the job. They wanted him to replace Beal. Like, it's not something that they've just plucked out of thin air. It's It was part of the recruitment process that got us Beal. So it's not as random as it looks, but yeah, you are going from one polar opposite to another. You couldn't get, I don't think you could get fined really, apart from possibly Russell Martin, you couldn't find two more different managers in the world than Gareth Ainsworth and Martin <laughs> Sifwen. Like, apart from maybe Russell Martin at this end of the scale. It is, so it does look a bit mad, I'll give you that. Yeah. Um... <laughs> oh God. And... Um... I just want to reiterate, obviously, my point there, that was is nothing to do with Martin Fuentes because, sorry, Fuentes or however on earth it is. <laughs> yeah, we're getting... uh, so I'm getting it wrong already. And I've just... No, no, I, like I say, he needs to abandon <laughs> He needs to abandon the idea that it's going to be pronounced with, as an F. Right? That's that's first thing. And this... second, the second thing, he probably needs to abandon the idea that uh, Azmir Begovic can pass the ball around in his own pen. Oh, that, is, that is a whole <laughs> other issue. I think it's itself. going to be quite... I think it's going to be quite a learning curve for the guy, but particularly starting at Rotherham. I mean, welcome to England, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> um, this, uh, this is my problem with this situation. I am very, very glad and excited by this appointment. This, as you mentioned, and the same boat as you, these are the type of managers that I want QPR to go for. My problem with this situation is that we were barking down this road at the start of last season, appointing Mick Beal also, as you rightly mentioned, highlighting Fifuentes as the right type of manager that they want to build a project around at this football club. The problem is that you go with Beal, you build this team around Beal, you then build up this expectation in players' mind that this tactical knowledge and he embeds a style 
which in reality did really suit a lot of our players. And then obviously we were all aware of the, the massive aftermath with, with Critchley and then Ainsworth. And that's where the buck stops. And this is what pisses me off, is that you go on all about doing this project and then you throw the whole thing out the window and appoint Ainsworth. And then now you suddenly think, well, you've had a transfer window where you've brought in players like Begovic who cannot play football with his feet and other players which aren't of this playing out of the back style like you cooked. Good players, don't get me wrong, but it completely goes away what they were trying to achieve at the end of last season. So what you do now is you've built this squad at the start of this season to throw that out the window and fulfil Ainsworth's approach to football. Now, when Ainsworth goes and you've barked down this road, which you really wanted to go down and abandoned your plans, you then bring in a manager, which is somewhat of Ainsworth and somewhat of maybe what you did before. You don't now go back, complete U-turn with a squad, which isn't really that fit for what you wanted to achieve previously, and expect that in a predicament like we're in now, under this huge pressure, that suddenly this really beautiful football, this Spanish Cruyff-esque football, is going to get us out of this problem. And this is nothing on Fifuentes. Um, and I am, I am, I, I know I say all this. This is my, this is my furiation at the board and those making the decisions and just the how quickly they can set out on this big plan, throw it out the window, create a new one, and then go back to it. Um, look, I'm really excited by this appointment. I think he, he does so much of what we wanted previously. I just hope that he can adapt to this league and its requirements. I think that one of the most interesting points I think he made in that interview today, which kind of gave me a lot of confidence, but we'll, we'll kind of see how that transpires, was the fact of this is the fourth time in his career that he's come into a club mid-season. That kind of gives me, it makes me sleep a little easier at night. Um, he's got a hell of a job, hell of a job. And going from those contrasting styles is going to be extremely interesting to see how he mani manages to implement that in such short fruition um, with the predicament we're in. Um, I mean, the, the, the one positive, the players weren't particularly suited. To, I mean, he has sort of brought his players in and it's and they're not suited to Sir Fuentes either, really, but they weren't suited to Ainsworth football. So it's not like he's taken over a Tony, a taken over like Stoke after eight years of Tony Pulis. No. So I'm, I'm hoping it is retrievable. And maybe we'll just look back on the Ainsworth thing as an aberration. But the, the point you make is a good one because it's something this ownership have done all the way through their ownership. It's like, right, Here's the plan. We're going to have a director of football and a chief executive who are going to run the club day to day. And we're going to go down this route of developing players and having development coaches. And we're going to let them have their head and they're going to run the recruitment process and do it because we're all around the world with our own businesses and we're absent and we don't know what we're doing when it comes to football. So they're going to run the club. And we tick along quite nicely doing that for a little while. And, you know, Les makes mistakes and whatever. But the the whole idea is at least solid. Like, this is what QPR are going to do. We're going to be a development club. We're going to be selling club. We're going to have a director of football model. And then every now and again, Tony Fernandez flies in, like lands at Heathrow and walks in and goes, Ian Holloway is your manager now. And they go, <laughs> is, is, is he? And, and they're like, yeah. Here he is, uh, Ian, right, and and then flies out again. And they have to deal with Ian Holloway being mad for like 18 months. And then they come and then they like, right, okay, well, we've got rid of Ian Holloway now, but we're gonna, we'll run this recruitment process for the manager. And Fernandez is like, no, it's Steve McLaren's your manager now. And again, so you've then got the people running the club have then got a manager that they don't want and wouldn't have appointed. And Steve McLaren turns around and says, oh yeah, all your ja all your summer signings that you're going to make, I don't like any of them, so we're not going to do that anymore. So I'm like, right, okay. They finally got like Warburton, sound appointment, followed on by Beal. Like, so at least now we're appointing the same kind of managers for the same kind of reasons. And like Critchley didn't do very well, but he is a logically sound follow on from yeah, Beal. Absolutely. And then, and then Amit Batia turns up in his Rolls Royce and goes, hey, yeah, Gareth Haynes was your manager now. And then like, Izzy, that is fascinating. So it's like they've got the plan, but they don't stick to the plan. And they, like they had the plan for selling players, and we sold Smithies and reinvested the money, and then we sold Freeman and reinvested the money, and then we sold Eze and reinvested the money. I was like, oh, this is actually going quite well. And then 
we get Johansson and Austin on loan. We win a few games, end the season well, and they go, right, we're not going to sell any more players. Uh, we're going for promotion this year and we're going <laughs> to sign Johansson and Austin and Andre Gray and Moses Odebajo and Lee Wallace is getting a two-year contract and we're going to go for it. We're going to spend 25 million quid doing it. It's like, that's no, no, stick to the plan, stick to the plan. So hopefully with the news that we're coming on to and the board movements and whatever, that they've gone back, they've admitted defeat, they've put the manager in charge that probably should have been in charge like when they appointed Bill, should have replaced Bill. Hopefully they're going to go back to that. And you've just got to leave him in charge now. Like if we go down, we mm. go down. Like Yeah. Because he's not, you haven't done the short-term fire fight your Warnock thing, have you? So if he's not able to fight the fire and you end up relegated, well, you can't, if we're not very good in 20 games time, what you're going to do sack this guy and God knows what they do. You know, like you can't zigzag back. You've gone back to the plan now. Stick to the bloody plan. Mm. Yeah. Before, before we come on to, before we come on to these board changes and that's, that's my exact position. That's my exact position. Um, I could do, I'd like to disagree with you a bit more to have a bit more debate, but I'm very <laughs> much in agreement um, that that's the thing now. It's, this I, is I, think, so I think Taylor Richards is the future. <laughs> let's, let's chat about that. No, I actually agree. I actually agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not even going to come on to his Twitter nonsense. That man is just like an, I'm, I'm sorry. Like these things now. Uh, this, I'm probably getting onto an era. I shouldn't have started. Actually, I went really. Yeah, no, really I'm, I'm sorry. Team. I'm sorry for bringing it yeah, up. Yeah, no, you know, on, you really came up on, massively there. You really it, came, it came up on Finney's podcast last night, and I talked about it for ten minutes, having said I wasn't going to talk about it. And I laid in bed last night, going, oh, "I'm not sure you should have said that." So yeah, let's just leave Taylor parked over there. Yeah. Retweet. Patience is brain thing. You shouldn't cool. be retweeting. We'll, yeah, we'll part, we'll leave that. We'll leave that. Um, coming back to what we're talking about before, um, Richards dearly threw me off track. That's the thing now. Um, there's no, you know, I'm hearing three year contracts for for few emperors. Um, you know, you made your bed, you got to line it now. And it, I mean, he, I think he had experience. It, he went joined the team that got relegated, and he got them back up the next the next season. I know this is complete non contextual given some of the this, some of the leagues that these are in, but I think it's a man that I think for him, this is his opportunity almost. Um, he's managed in some lesser leagues. I think he knows the limelight. He knows kind of the opportunity. And this, well, this is when I start thinking about this. I'm getting a little bit of deja vu in terms of big opportunity, wants to main, make a name for himself, young manager the, that maybe sees this as a big opportunity for him as a career step. But um, yeah, that does that does ring a few bells in terms of. You're telling me he's, he's, he's going to be the Glasgow Rangers manager by the end of the year <laughs> or by the end of the I month. I did tweet about it? that. Yeah, the other day. Um, so yeah, I am getting that sense, but I don't know. Not that I know the man in any shape or form, but he, I, I feel like he's 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 really what he really wanted this job. You can see that the, the club had, had seen him as a long term target, and you could kind of see how quickly he wanted to move a bit. Um, and like you say, I think this is this is the, the direction now. Um, we get relegated. You've got to stick with it. It's going to be interesting in terms of how he, he talks about in his interview. It's well established that he likes a 4 4 3. Sorry, a 4 4 3? God, he's, he's able to play 12 players. We'd all, mate, we'd all four... like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, just not playing with 10 would be nice at the moment. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're good. Play with eleven will feel like an extra time. man. Yeah, um, a four-three-three. Three. Um, he's played inverted fullbacks. He's played deep line fullbacks. Um, he's played three at the back. He's a man that sees that flexibility, and I think it is that cliche, isn't it? It's each manager, you know, I'll base it on the context of the football club and the players available. I think that'll be really interesting as to, to how quickly because he hasn't got that pre-season, that nice sort of buffer period where he's got time to try out new formations. So he's probably, I think he's had an inkling for the last couple of weeks the job was coming. Um, hence why it happened so quickly. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Um, and, and he, and he, he hasn't run quick. a mile. That's a good sign, mate. Like he's, he's been watching our games for the last few weeks. If I'd been, I mean, I've been watching those and I, I never want to see QPR ever again. Never mind manage them. So I was just like, yeah. He's, he's, he's how much worse can it get time. though? To be fair, like... <laughs> oh, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it's God, almost a free hit. Uh, no. um, <laughs> how do you... How do you... What, like, kind of... 
how do you think it's going to go? I know this is extremely stupid of a question, but like, what's your sort of prediction? Like, how do you see him adapting? Like, this is this is this is just ambiguous, but I'd I'd be interested to hear what how you kind of think that he could how he this... could get them get him going almost. Okay, so there's some gains to obviously be had from the city. So as soon as a new manager comes in, he always says, clean slate, everybody starts again. And in Willock and Richards, you do have two supposedly very good players, two of your top earners who haven't been playing. So I'd be surprised if they weren't involved, pretty because potentially that's two sort of new signings there. Um, we We don't score any goals with our attack. Um, when he was at Hammerby, in his first season, did very well, got to a cup final, finished third, got them in Europe and whatever. And then they sold eight of his players. And this season, he's been trying, by his own admission, he's been trying to play his way with players that aren't really suited to it, a mixture of youth teamers and what they could find in the transfer market. Um, and at times this year, he's played without a striker because his strikers are rubbish. So he's played... Mm -hmm with two false nines, I think is the, the trendy term. So you could actually see him trying that with Chair and Willock. Like, whether it would work or not, I don't know. We don't score from central midfield. Like, that Andre Dezel goal on Saturday, he should be getting six, five or six of those a season. With his technique and ability, he should be arriving in the box like that and scoring goals like that way, way more often. And Samfield should as well, particularly Samfield's good in the air. Samfield mm. should score way more goals than he does. So you could, like, you've got goals from central midfield. The fullbacks are a big part of how he goes about it. You know, Paul, that's what he was brought here to do under Beale. And I remember Watford away last year with Laird and Paul like flying at Watford all afternoon. You know, that's that was the Beale sort of ideal, wasn't it? So we've mm. got Paul to do that. And I think Reggie Cannon's a great sign, and I can't believe yeah. he's here. And I don't think he can either. I think it's no, two no. conversations with the, with his agent about what on earth they've done to his career. So that's a good player to come in and play in that way. So there's like there's three things straight away there that you that you might be able to try. Um, I don't I don't see it going particularly well, but I, I'm I'm, I'm always <laughs> like I'm, I'm, well, I don't, but I'm always I'm always hesitant to say how much worse can it be because at QPR it can always there's always another door into another room full of even more people that hate you than before. So it can always get worse. But I'm watching us like. Over the past few weeks, watching us at home to Blackburn, like how much worse can it actually get? Than yeah, that, that, that fourth goal where like they actually gave the ball back to us in the end, and then Larkesh passed it through for them to run through on goal. I think I <laughs> like laid an egg over that. I, I apologise yeah. to everyone that was sitting near me in the Blackburn game. I like I promised I wasn't going to lose it this season. And <laughs> it went out so yeah, you might be right. How much worse can it be? So you know, I'm excited to find out. Um, I am a little bit scared about the idea of Begovic playing around in his six-yard box. I've got to be honest. So um, maybe he'll do that big sort of new manager contrary thing, and the first thing he'll do is drop Begovic, and uh, you know Joe Walsh will play in goal because you know he can pass and whatever. Um, mm. You know, we, I mean, we had Senny Dieng last year who let in every shot he faced, but was our best outfield player. He'd be absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be absolutely brilliant in this, wouldn't he? Look. Uh, but yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. Um, I, I'm inclined to think after that Blackburn game, I mean, anything's worth a try, isn't it? Like, mm, well, we have tried everything now. Look, I think the one thing for me is, I think we've established that with this squad over the last 12 months, that a new manager bounce is, is simply, is there's not a word for it, it just doesn't exist with this squad. I just don't understand this, this concept that every other club in the country seems to benefit from. But I think the one thing why this could be different is we saw how butthurt those players were when Michael Beale left that club in terms of everything that he offered them. You, you could see all the interviews and all raving about his, his tactical insight and the information he was disseminating to the players and the way he communicated. And you just get that sort of sense that if you went as... His, in, his, you know, his football intellect, his, his tactical approach. His, you could see how intelligent. I was astounded in that interview how good his English was. Um, and I think that's one thing that the players will really, really welcome. He's almost a Spanish Mick Beale in many senses. In, in that sort of approach and that sort of um, 
approach to, to management and communication. I think that's one reason why this could be a little bit different. I think the players will extremely welcome this change. Um, so I think that's one reason that does give me a little bit more optimism um, than before. But I think it's going to be a super, super interesting appointment. Um, I one that is... mate, I, mate, I think that's a great point. And uh, you can look forward to it being stolen and put in my match preview on Friday. So, okay. <laughs> Because it is, they, it is little... exactly, exactly. They don't want to play aims with football, like they, mm. they. So, yeah, I think it's a really good point, mate. So before Zoom uh, really interrupted us, uh, just another point I think was worth um, bringing up. Well, um, in terms of recruitment, I think it's going to be interesting as to what happens in January with so so little budget and, and even how they convinced Fifi Wentes. To, to join the club with um, not really much ability to attain any new talent. But I think what could be more interesting, in fact, is potentially now his ability of, of these foreign leagues and in, in scouting um, gems of, you know, that potentially we haven't really looked at before. But then, it, then I kind of got myself thinking to, oh, but then are we falling back into that trick of, of Michael Beale letting, letting us run our transfer window without director of football and, it's just going to be a, you know, I'm just fascinated by this appointment. Um, and there's so many unknowns and so many, there's just so many facets to it that I'm just here in just in pure amazement and in pure excitement. But before we come on to Batty, is there any other point you just want to, just to bring up about Pippi Wintes or anything yeah, to come on I as mean, further? He's, he's head coach. Like, you're right, you're right about the, um, the Beal stuff. Um, you know, we let him run our recruitment last summer and that, that was mm. part of the problem. Um, so the manager and the head coach should have an input, but not to the extent that Beal just brought all his boys in. Um, <laughs> but we, do, we, don't, we don't have a director of football at the minute. So you would hope that that process is, is in process. We do have a head of recruitment and I think we're going much more back to that model because I think this is basically his appointment. I think him, him and his team will have identified um Cifuentes to begin with so I think we're going much more towards that there isn't a lot of money as you said well there isn't a lot of FFP headroom to do any signings anyway mm. um although we've got five loan spots open um and we're sponsoring any every anything <laughs> every minute to try and free up some FFP headroom so maybe there <laughs> might be a like sponsoring everything aren't we like hand dryers I'm amazed it's taken us that long to work out that oh, no. um you know, Stoke City and their accounts post £10 million of sponsorship every season in Stoke. And it's all Bet365, which is their owner's company. And QPR last year, I think, posted £1.2 million. You know, that's just being dumb, isn't it? Like, just stick the chairman's name on everything, which is what <laughs> we belatedly realised that you can do. So maybe there'll be a little bit. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't... He's a head coach. Like, like I say, yeah. Hammerby they sold eight of his 11 from last season and then handed him a load of youth teamers and weird and wonderful purchases for this season that weren't really suited to him. So he is, he is used to that. And it is an appointment much more in that mold rather than someone coming in and demanding, uh, you know, five or six players. I think if he'd done that, he wouldn't have the job because, you know, we just don't have the money to do it at the minute. Mm. Okay. Look, let's both throw ourselves under the bus. I want a prediction from you. Will if Marty Fifuentes Make it to the end of the season, and will he keep us up? I think he'll make it to the end of the season, but I, I've, I've got. Come I, on, I, I, come on, come on! There's a yes or no question, club. I want to play this. Well, I don't think we will. I, I don't think we will stay up because I just don't think we score enough okay. goals. You've got the goals to get you out of the trouble. So I hope I'm wrong. But obviously, I appreciate. I appreciate your honesty. Appreciate your honesty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Not that you asked, but I'm going to say that um, he will be here at the end of the season and he will keep us up just. We'll, be, we'll finish 20, 21st. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> That's enough about... Because to be honest, I think there's only so much you can say about our man, Fifty Winters, because like not that much really correlates or is transferable. He's still a little bit of an unknown, not being in the English league. Um, so there's only so much we're going to digress into him, apart from just pure excitement that somebody's not going to rock up in uh, leather boots and 
um, a, a jungle hanging out from their top button. Um, let's go for now. Um, Amit Batia departing the club as chairman. I'm going to try and keep my cool about this one, I think, actually, because I feel like I could go up to just get a little bit irate. Um, Lee Hoos has stepped in as the Queen's Park Rangers chairman. Clive, you start off because I don't which want to, you, I'm no, going which to go bit down. You angry, which bit are you angry about, Lee? Uh, Amit Batia's golf trips with Kevin Peterson or, uh, or Lee who's moving into the job? Which bits Which bits annoy him? The latter. I mean, Batty was never at the club, so him being officially... I mean, he wasn't even a majority shareholder. He was never at the club, so for him now not to be at the club makes no difference to me. But Lee Hoos, on the other hand, stepping in as chairman, who I frankly cannot believe is still at the club this season, has... Let's, I, do you know what? I saw the quote earlier, and I should have written it down. And it was, I know nothing about football. I'm just here for the numbers or something. It's something to those lines. Don't quote me directly. I, I saw it earlier from an interview. But now, you are the chairman of the football club, Lee. Um, yeah, uh, Clive, please take it away. Yeah, I feel yeah, I feel a bit bad because I think I I think I that quote has actually come from from me based on like wh- when he first arrived. That is the sort of thing he said. I'm not sure yeah. it's a direct quote. I think I've basically hung him by saying that. So, so. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's common. Yeah, I, I, I mean, well, I've got. I think I've got good news for you then. Because like Amit Batia's role at the club, like as chairman, was just a figurehead thing. Yeah, like, he absolutely. Doesn't really have, he doesn't really have uh, any significant stake in the business. Mm. You know, it's all Ruben. And um, he was basically made chairman because at the time Tony Fernandez was just getting absolute pelters left, yeah. right, and centre, which he doesn't like. And you know, so he wanted to sort of be out of the firing line. Amit at that point was very, very, very popular. Everyone loved him, remembered him fondly. Smooth talker, isn't he? Like even at the fans' yeah. forum, like everyone eating out the palm of his hand. So you put him as you put him as chairman, but he's not there day to day. He's not, you know, making decisions other than, like I say, swooping in one day with Gareth Ainsworth. Um, you know, he's playing golf with Kevin Peterson, isn't he? And that's it's his a PR life. move, wouldn't it? It's a PR move. Yeah. Just, yeah. So that was a PR move. He had no control or whatever. So I wouldn't worry too much about Lee who's going into that role because that role's a bit of a nonsense. Um, what I, th- well, what it is, it, they're moving Lee who's upstairs. He's obviously been sort of coming to the end of his time as CEO. Like, people are on his back. There's been some mistakes made. They deviated from the plan. It's just, it's felt like it's needed freshening up and some new ideas, some fresh impetus up there. So you move Lee who's into an upstairs role, which is more of a figurehead role, less hands-on, not there every day, more time with the family, and you appoint a new chief executive, you run a recruitment for that, and we get a new chief executive, which we have needed, and I think that's what that's what this is, and I think by the new year, you will have a new chief executive. So it looks ridiculous at the moment because you wanted Lee Hughes to leave and actually he's got an extra role to go with a role you already <laughs> didn't want to have. So I get like, so it looks uh, ridiculous on that, but I think it's part of a process and things have come to a head in the last couple of weeks that they were probably working on anyway. And it's come to a head because things are going so badly that, well, we may as well just do it. We've got to do it now because everything's gone to shit, mate. Um, so mm. Lee Hughes is moving upstairs and there'll be a new chief executive in January. I would be willing to place quite a large bet on with you that that's what's happening here. And by January, Hughes will be a sort of more hands-off figurehead overseeing the club day to day, sort of for the owners who are off and abroad and whatever, but there'll be a new chief executive and hopefully a new director of football, although that might be further down the road, but certainly a new chief executive by the new year. I think you've actually got what you want, even though you don't think you have. Yeah, no, no, when you put it like that. Um, well, if I'm, wrong, with... if I'm wrong, then, but I don't, I don't think But that, that sounds too sensible for QPR. Um, <laughs> and if that is the case, then, I mean, it, it, it makes sense in terms of a continu- continuity perspective, Batia leaving the club um, and almost the, the parting of the rails, the rails? Parting of the reins. Um, i going to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there's just something about Lee Hoos that just, just it's brought you out in a rash. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I don't hate him that much. I mean, he's he's not my favourite. Um, but I think well, when I rate, I I really rated him when he came in, and our previous chief exec was a numpty, 
and I thought Lee Hughes was a breath of fresh air and I really and he's got a, a decent record at other clubs and I've got a lot more time for him than a lot of people have but there's been some really bad mistakes there's been some stuff happen in the last couple of years that he said would not happen he said you may not like me you may not like the answers I give but you'll never have an FFP problem yeah you know we will stick to the plan and we have got an FFP problem and we haven't stuck to the plan and they're you know and you still don't like his answers so you know what is it what is the point of view when it gets to that point whether you like him or hate him or rate him or think it's his fault or whatever it's definitely come to the point where you've got you've got a part ways and yeah that is although it doesn't appear so today i'm sure that's what's happening here he's been shuffled upstairs there'll be a new chief exec january february let's hope so i mean it, it wouldn't go missed to have a director of football you know at some point um, that wouldn't be our worst idea, I don't think either. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, maybe that will come tomorrow. I mean, there's so many announcements. Maybe one of those will come tomorrow, and then maybe one of those Friday. Like the yeah. way we're going, it's new logical. Chief exec, new chief exec tomorrow, new director of football Friday. Get done by Rotherham, and we'll be looking for a new manager again by Monday. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. Oh, what about a few sponsorships in between there, maybe? Um, yeah, so we've got the, the training ground, the stadium. What's next? I mean, the, the sponsorships, like we say, I just... I can't believe they weren't on that before. This is what I mean. Yeah. When Lee Hughes came in, he was so good with the finer details of stuff, he was a proper finer details guy. And then you, you know, like we come to this point where the, the owners are putting in whatever they're putting in, £1.5, £2 million pounds a month to keep it going, but it doesn't count on FFP. And someone's turned around and gone, you know, if you did that as a sponsorship, it does count on FFP. And everyone's like, oh. So I'd like, how has it taken like that long to, to realise that? Um, so I, ca I can't yeah. wait to see what they sponsor next. Like hand dryers, like <laughs> toilets. It's obviously just everything is going to have Ruben's name on it, like everywhere. Um but that's, that's FFP and that's modern football. So. Yeah, and to be honest, I think it was done in a respectable way. If it was named the My Trade Stadium, I think there would have been more up all. But I think the My Trade, basically just My Trade, then Loftus Road Stadium, I can live with that as long as we're not getting a points deduction almost. I think that's almost where you got to look at it. And I think everyone sort of comes to terms like now. 1.2 million injected on our FFP line, I, I think is, is a godsend across the three years. So You explain um, it to people like that. They're fine yeah. with it. Yeah. Like, of, course, of course, we don't want it to be called May Trade Stadium or May Trade Loftus Road. But look, this is the situation. You want us to sign players. You know, this is the score. Like, this is a way we can do it. I think if you just be really, really honest with people and don't dress it up as like the Battier family of deep seated connections to QPR and love QPR and just want to see their name up on South Africa <laughs> so much. Do they bollocks? Like it's an FFP, it's an FFP workaround. They should just put that on the official website. They go just go, guys. Uh, we're gonna call that stand the bat here stand now. It's an FFP workaround. Uh cheers. That would that should just be the stuff <laughs> on the official website. Like like when Martin Allen used to write the press releases at Chesterfield. <laughs> just like let's be really honest about what it is. I'm not against it. Transparency is key. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so, um we have covered the four areas that we did set out to um, and in some fashion and it's been some good fun in doing so. Thank you very much, Clive, for no being, to be honest, you're almost now like 100% ratio in terms of probably my last two videos in the last year you've been in as many as I have. So, um, me, yeah. It's me hand. and you now, mate. That's all that's left. <laughs> yeah. The QPR nuclear apocalypse has occurred <laughs> and all that's left is me and you sitting in back bedrooms going... What do you think of that? <laughs> oh, okay, that was good fun. Look, thank you all for watching very much if you're still with us. Um, it's been an interesting week at QPR and I can assure you that over the next week it'll probably just be as interesting. So um, enjoy Rotherham, enjoy Fifuentes and let's bleed some optimism. Thanks, Clive. I'll, um, I'm sure, do you know what I'm going to say? I'll catch you in the next one, actually, because inevitably you will be here. So that's just what I've decided. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> Come on, you are.